Hi, everybody. It's Tuesday. And after a really fabulous visit from Josh Simons on his way to Dragon Con on Thursday, which was a really wonderful kind of ask me anything experience where I ended up popping out of my seat every few minutes to bring up some image or website from the many folks that Josh was alluding to, be it the islands of Sina Una or uh, Kelly the Opera Geek or his own work or pulling up, of course, Demi Plane, uh, which has had a big announcement today uh, with the incorporation of Darrington Presses. Um, 5e content as part of its 5e nexus. Uh, exciting times. Uh, and I was really proud of my students' first experience in asking someone in the TTRPG field about their work and asked some really challenging questions. As I've mentioned on my socials, at least one student asked such a good question. I said, did you write that question down? Make sure you have it for all of our other guests. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens. And of course, I find that that's true of a lot of the work in this space. I was talking to Lynn Codega earlier today in a very snappy, like quick exchange about the kind of questions we come back to again and again uh, when we're interviewing folks in the TTRPG space, which is, uh, you know, kind of a trick of the trade. We can see kind of change over time. We can also see the way that different people in different positionalities in the space are talking. And so at the end of my recap in about 20 minutes before we open up to questions, uh, We'll also come back to our next guest on Thursday because uh, my students couldn't have made a better segue into that if I'd thought of it myself. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Today was Mechanics Day. This week, the student's task by the end of the week is to take a look at their game and look very closely at the mechanics, kind of understanding not only how to play the game, but also thinking a little bit intensely about what players can and can't do, are encouraged to do, and also what, if there's a game master or a dungeon master or a facilitator, what are they expected to do in the way of preparation, in terms of facilitating during play, all of those sorts of things. And for those who are doing things like solo journaling games, what does the kind of shape of the game encourage, require, demand, facilitate, uh, open up in different kinds of ways. So to constrain our class discussion, and in, and we still could have gone on for days, uh, and we will be coming back to a lot of these questions again and again, I decided to focus on the mystery mechanics of particular systems. Their primary preparation for this class was the 29-page uh, quick start for Candela Obscura and the roughly equal amount of the first part of Brindlewood Bay. So that was what they were coming to class with. They also had available to them, and some of them are already familiar with, uh, John Harper's Blades in the Dark and Call of Cthulhu. Um, so all students were familiar with Brindlewood Bay and Candela, and we had some other familiarity kind of floating around. I was here in my office printing out f probably too many pages of character sheets from all four systems, as well as uh, Blades in the Dark's kind of sheet of player moves. And of course, things like the circle and crew uh, pages that uh, Candela and Blades have, so that we had spread out over our tables. Uh, each student had a half a dozen sheets of paper that they were wrangling individually, and then there were uh, a couple of other sheets floating on the table. I have a document camera in my classroom, and so I could hot swap as discussion went on between the different sheets of paper as we were talking about them. Before class even started, I come in about an hour, hour and a half early just because of parking weirdness uh, at our institution and the classroom is empty so I set up everything. I took advantage of that time 
to do a little bit of a closer rewatch of the second half of Candela Obscura's chapter two, which started last Thursday. Students were given the option and indeed kind of encouraged to dip into at least 20 to 30 minutes of Candela uh, as part of the preparation for class, just because it's current events, as it were. And I was really pleased that I had thought to do that because Spencer's running of the game, No Shade to Matt Mercer, is of course the designer playing the game and both we can see the play style as kind of imagined by one of the creators, but also some interesting rule breaking uh, in terms of the way that an assignment structure works. Uh, For those of you who haven't seen uh, Candela chapter two just yet, I do encourage you to do so. Basically, in order to start with a hot start, um, what Spencer does is have the first part of the kind of uh, episode, you have the hook as it is kind of deployed in the quick start guide, which is to say cinematic, third person, completely unconnected to the per point of view of the players. And then he goes into what we would think of as like the final scene, the final act of a completely different uh, assignment. We begin in Midias Res. Um, The pace is very uh, intense. The stakes are quite high. Uh, The roles are extremely dangerous. There are a lot of marks being thrown around, um, often two at a time. Uh, as we kind of tumble to the end of that assignment and then transition into the next assignment. That's an interesting choice uh, on Spencer's part. I think it worked remarkably well to kind of hook the audience and show how to have a little bit of playful fun within the mechanics of the game. I realized as I was setting up for class, incidentally, that while Spencer Stark's style is indeed quite cinematic, uh, not just in Candela, but I think more broadly. What's interesting when we do get in the second half a kind of character description moment, because the pace has cooled, the new assignment has happened, and we're in a kind of moment of transition and transportation, that the players almost entirely moved to a more novelistic space, which is not traditional critical role, which is an interesting phrase to say, but it's also not Candela per se. It is very much uh, more transparent than that, what, what fiction can do in a novel, which is put us into the mindset of people, have us read people in ways that the people the people around them wouldn't. Uh, And I thought that was really interesting. I don't know what to do with that, but it was on my mind as I was starting class Uh, because I basically kept Candela running until the the two hour, like the two o'clock mark. And what that meant was I often have students who are arriving early. And so they were able to see a little bit of the kind of middle of the second half, even if they hadn't seen it already. Um, Interesting technical note. Um, my classroom is wired for sound with mics and uh, and camera and the whole nine yards. Um, it was not explicitly intended for our kind of post, uh, you know, COVID reality, but uh, instead it's just a feature of the fact that this is a fairly new building, uh, which is very useful for our virtual visitors. But what was interesting is I didn't want to turn the sound up way too high because I was afraid of getting yelled at by other classrooms nearby. But it meant that the lower registers, like Luis Carrazzo and Travis Willingham in particular, became kind of inaudible, um, which is not something that I had experienced in that class before. And I'm uh, going to try to figure out how to deal with that better for, you know, which could apply to any other, you know, kinds of technical issues. And so as class began, I kind of gestured to, this is the first time we've actually collectively looked at a visual actual play. So I kind of pointed out um, the kind of traditional elements of this, the kind of critical role inspired multi-camera, everyone's on camera all the time and watching them, but also kind of noted the ways in which Candela kind of deviates from critical roles, uh, typical layout. These folks are in costume. The set has depth uh, and is fully dressed. Uh, There are no personal items of the players. 
uh, in front of them. Instead, it's this kind of immersive. Even the glasses are the glasses, uh, you know, that look uh, authentic in this kind of way, whatever authenticity means in a kind of imagined world that's not our own. Um, so use that as a kind of transition moment of gesture before I introduce them to what was in front of them, uh, which was uh, Inspectors, uh, a game that is literally older than they are, uh, which is a kind of combination of reality television show meets Ghostbusters. I am indebted to Evan Torner for bringing it to my attention and indeed running it for me and uh, some colleague friends uh, over the summer. Then they recognized Brindlewood Bay's materials as well as Candela's. And then they also had a character sheet from Call of Cthulhu uh, as a kind of reference. And so that's a lot of paper to wrangle uh, and some things that were totally new to them. And so I gave the first 10 minutes of class over to firing up the Candela soundtrack because it's handy and it's uh, easily available uh, and asking students to annotate them however they wanted. They could look for continuities across these. They could look for things they were confused by that they'd like to ask for clarification on. They can try to, they could try to find ways in which uh, these mechanics were similar in different kinds of ways, like kind of uh, whatever they wanted to do. Uh, I just said in you know, somewhere between five to 10 minutes, we're going to come back together and I'm going to expect that you have something on your piece sheet of paper. And what was really lovely is that some students had already taken a lot of notes in their notebooks about the two systems, uh, which was, uh, which was great. Uh, and so they were able, some of those students were able to focus more on the games that were new, the game elements that were new to them and in inspectors and Cthulhu. But Basically, they were ready to go at about eight minutes, and a lively discussion ensued. Um, students were very quick to recognize uh, the distinction in terms of player agency uh, and DM responsibility in these different games. They were also quick to note, um, you know, the different levels of complexity. And we talked about first the, you know, the bonus of a, a more lightweight system like Brindlewood Bay is you get to the table almost immediately. You have a very few choices to make um, before you get going. But as one student noted, that also means that there's a lot you don't know about the character until you maybe start putting on crowns. Um, and you have to be intentional about putting on those crowns because you generally don't do those until you're in danger. So it's an interesting kind of, that means that if you want those character moments, you either have to generate them yourself or you have to communicate to your DM that you want scenarios in which the crowns are put on. Uh, on the other end, you've got the crunch of Cthulhu and the amount of time that that takes to roll a character. Um, and we talked a lot about how time uh, kind of works in each of these games. And what was very interesting uh, that came up as we were talking about this, we talked about what were the affordances of each of these systems. What, what is the ideal kind of play state for these games? But what we ended up also talking about is the ways that players are humans that interact with these games and can potentially modify and transform them. So I gave my students the example of um, you know, my experience of running Candela versus my experience of watching Candela. And I pointed to the fact that, you know, Candela, to, uh, last week's Candela is over four hours, uh, even if you subtract like the mid roll and pre roll and those sorts of things. Whereas I've run an assignment, the quick start assignment uh, for Candela in under two hours. And that's, really a play style thing about, okay, so this game comes into contact with different kinds of players. And, you know, if, a, if players are really keen on forward momentum and are not seeking out moments for creating character beats, you can move at a pretty quick clip if you want to. Uh, and that's not a critique of the system. That's just a note of there are different ways to play a game and different players. And so an encounter of 
of saying, oh, systems make you do a thing. Well, they kind of do and they kind of don't, right? Because human beings will almost inevitably break any system that you put in front of them. Uh, and, or they'll, 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 you know, make them, make it fit, right? Uh, they'll, they'll squish their little butts around in it. Um, and so we, we talked a little bit about the, the way that that impacts everything as well, uh, which is, which was super cool and not entirely what I expected. And then we took a turn into lore, um, because some students are indeed obsessed with Blades in the Dark, obsessed with Candela, obsessed with uh, Cthulhu. And as one student noted, one of the other distinctions that's import really important to understanding uh, that's not mechanical per se, but it, it seems to contribute to uh, the mechanics uh, of how you run the game is the fact that uh, Blades in the Dark has Duskfall and Candela has New Fair, and those are very lore and geographically rich uh, places. Brindlewood Bay doesn't have a map. Brindlewood Bay has NPCs for a particular mystery, but not as much of a kind of you need to do the homework before you before you play it as the kind of facilitator. Inspectors, same deal, right? You're making stuff up on the fly. Whereas there is an enormous amount of lore and different factions and different elements, it's a little bit more streamlined, at least in what we've seen of Candela, right? There's so much we can't say about Candela because we have a quick start guide. Uh, and that's another thing to talk about, right? It's like, what does the quick start guide give you versus what the full book's going to give us? We won't know just yet, um, but we do know from Blades that Duskfall is deep and rich and layered and there's lots of different places. And that led to story time with Dr. Friedman uh, giving the example of, uh, you know, what this kind of open world impact can be in, uh, so, say, something like Dungeons and Dragons, um, where my friends and I had pooled our money, uh, used that you know, professor funding, uh, not our actual professor funding, just the fact that we had jobs, uh, to come together and buy one of the Platinum Beetle and Grimm's uh, editions several years ago for Waterdeep Dragon Heist. And our DM was very excited about it, except he has a kid who hadn't yet gone to kindergarten and did not have time to prep for the all the possibilities that we could pick at any given time in this extremely open world, right? He just, he's like, we need to do something more linear. Um, and so Storm King Slender it is uh, for the moment. And so I said, you know, this is also the challenge of running uh, kind of games that have dense uh, places that feel very real, that uh, exist external to the GM, uh, but that the GM needs to kind of internalize in different kinds of ways. And uh, figuring out how much, uh, you know, is a is a thing to talk about, um, which then prompted an interesting question from a student that gave me a really good transition into uh, Thursday, which is that the, the student said, well, does Dungeons and Dragons have a setting like Duskfall and um, uh, and Candela's New Fair? And I said, well, yes, no, right? Um, the Forgotten Realms is obviously a touchstone for a lot of uh, the books, but there are lots of other settings. And of course, people play Dungeons and Dragons in all kinds of wacky ways. I play it in the 18th century, for God's sake. Um, and then the student said, uh, so do though all those settings come from adventures that people have played that then become these set settings? And I said, well, yes and no, right? Some of them do. Uh, some of the earliest settings uh, absolutely do come from that, like famously Greyhawk. Um, others come from other places, right? Um, so for example, like, you know, we can think about Ravnica is operating in a very different kind of way in terms of its origin and flowing into D and D, and then that led to a discussion about um, intellectual property, which is a little bit off the rails for a, a, a class a discussion on mechanics. But we were really close to the end, so I was willing to let it ride because we have a guest uh, who is 
intimately interested in the questions around uh, Wizards of the Coast, Hasbro, E1, uh, and D&D intellectual property, uh, Ned Donovan of Encounter Party, which is soon to be part of the new D&D Fast channel. And uh, so we were talking about, you know, I've written an essay for the Lon for the Los Angeles Review of Books called Who Owns D&D, &D, where I argued that the most successful intellectual property extensions into kind of these transmedia spaces of comic books and all these sorts of things, stuff like Critical Role, stuff that isn't owned by Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast, uh, because it's really hard to uh, extend a setting separate from characters. Um, and for like mainline D&D, &D, there are characters, right? There's Drist and there's any number of powerful um, kind of, but it's superheroes, right? It's not the, it's, uh, it's different in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and so that's been the challenge. And of course, uh, Wizards uh, has had many uh, kind of official actual plays uh, over the years, and they've had different kinds of challenges. Um, and so a Counterparty is the next one out the gate in terms of a kind of long form actual play or longish form actual play that is going to be uh, you know, Jenna, if you want to throw a question, uh, feel free to come back later and we'll talk. Uh, and we do this every Tuesday. So, hey, um, feel free to, uh, to come and talk. Um, so, yeah, so that was class. Uh, and it was really, um, I think, generative. And I think that it starts the ball rolling. So just for those uh, who might be new, um, as we transition into throated questions in the chat, if you've got them, uh, students have finally settled on a wide variety of uh, games. Uh, one student at the very last minute has, has pivoted to uh, Lighthouse at the Edge of the Universe because they really wanted a bedtime task for the rest of the semester. Um, and uh, we've got one student who's doing Blades and Candela and, oh, by the way, just for fun, a field guide to memory. Uh, it's what a time to be alive. Uh, so it's going to be interesting on Friday uh, to see, you know, how they're looking very seriously at the mechanics. And then we'll come back uh, with some more different lenses, ways of looking in the next couple of weeks. So we're going to take a week off from close reading uh, in order for them to go play out side of class. And inside of class, we're going to play The Quiet Year by Avery Alder. Uh, and then we will spend week six playing dialect uh, across two class sessions. And the idea is, again, they're being given space outside of class where they don't have to prep. So hopefully they'll be working on the game playing that need, they need to do outside of class with their adopted role-playing games. So it won't be for another fortnight that we come back to the question of games as metaphors. And so thinking even more intensely about um, mechanics con contributing to meaning. Um, and we'll be spending that time because that will be, oh my goodness, the week of Big Bad Con. Um, we're going to transition towards our live at Big Bad Con class uh, to talk about uh, the l specific lens of disability. Um, we'll use Shelley Jones's essay, Blinded by the Role, The Critical Fail of Disability in D&D &D from Analog Game Studies, as well as uh, Jen Kretschmer's Accessibility and Gaming Resources and the Combat Wheelchair. Uh, uh, and so, uh, but that's all coming up in, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but yeah, um, when do you stop looking for clues? Yeah, this is also something that came up a lot in class, Jenna, um, is Br in Brindlewood Bay, I every ver every time I've played Brindlewood Bay and I've pay played it a fair number of times at this point, I don't know whether it's like I'm an academic and I play with people who are often academics or that kind of nerd. But we never kind of speculate until we have we know we have enough clues where we know we're going to be right. And so that's really colored my interpretation of how the mechanic works, which is like, oh, you're always going to be right in a really weird red string conspiracy board kind of way. Um, whereas I have come to find out that from other people who do playtests, 
not other people do that kind of speculation phase throughout rolling the dice to see if they end up being right. Uh, and I compared this with my students to the fact that um, that's designed for a single session. Candela assignments are designed for generally a single session. And I'm playing a Regency Cthulhu adventure that's supposed to be two sessions, and it'll probably take a half a dozen at least because it's so open and my players keep asking fun questions in weird kinds of ways. Um, and the clue stage can go on, as Jenna says, indefinitely. Um, Ezra, you make a really good point about gumshoe, right? Like that the GM is much more explicit in uh, in gumshoe about you have collected all the clues, you know, kind of deal, um, which is also kind of a Brindlewood Bay thing. Although it's not a you have collected all the clues, but you do know what the challenge rating, so to speak, you know how many you need to, to keep in order. Uh, my friends uh, made, and we were playing online, um, a very early version of the game in 2020. It was our kind of early pandemic bonding moment when everyone was really locked down in New York. And our Excel spreadsheet, which, you know, there's a, a, a beautiful character management um, Excel uh, Google sheet uh, that is available. And we made a tab that was literally uh, would count how many clues that we had typed in and tell us, OK, you know, here's the modifier for the role at this point. Uh, and we I guess we abused that horribly. And it is and is and has warped my my play experience ever since. Um, and th that was a fair amount of kind of the, the, some of what came in, in discussion today was these kinds of ways where, um, our interpretation is often based in our play experience, but we are embodied people who bring uh, particular kinds of experience to the table when we play a new game and not just us, but like all the other people that we're playing with. So, we we can say what we think, and I think a lot of the time games criticism does talk about what the mechanics facilitate and foreclose, and I think that's appropriate, but what it runs up against in actual practice, what uh, Jen Grueling would call that kind of next level of narratology of, of how games are actually experienced, is the human beings at the table doing weird things like creating uh, an, you know, an extra tab on their, you know, collective spreadsheet or, you know, refusing, you know, refusing the call to not adventure, but refusing the call to intimacy. Uh, you know, uh, the, it, it's, it's very interesting in that kind of way. Um, uh, yeah. Ezra says, uh, if a game has a puzzle, uh, the solution is almost always uh, whatever the PCs come up with. Um, right. Uh, because, yeah, this is the challenge, right? Is, uh, you know, I was, Josh was talking about the puzzles of, um, of Children of Erte that Deborah Ann Wall creates. And it's so fascinating to me. There's, there's so much to be done with uh, the way that puzzles do and don't work in these kinds of spaces, because you're you're adding a layer of game of additional gameplay. Where if you play in character in that kind of actorly kind of way, you're still limited by like you can play a super genius, but if you're not a super genius, I'm certainly not. Uh, you you're you're having a kind of friction of uh, the kind of. Uh, you and your character kind of uh, kind of situation, and of course the flip is is true for people who play you know affable dum dums, uh, and then figure out the the clues and put it all together, but don't feel like the character would have. Um, uh, yeah, humans do weird things is like not probably the best title of my book, but it's certainly an accurate statement. Uh, and I think that's one of the beauties of the form is that it's malleable in this kind of way. Um, yeah. Hi, Steph. Um, welcome. Welcome. We're talking about mystery mechanics uh, and how class went today. Um, and yeah, in uh, that, that story focused and I, uh, you know, that story focused way of thinking about it, I think is a really useful way of thinking about 
um, you know, there are different poses, different positions from which we experience games. Um, and I think there are some folks who, especially when it comes to mysteries, are, are driven towards the solution. Uh, and for them, uh, th there's certain systems that are going to kind of prioritize that kind of discovery and putting things together. And then kind of, oh, but what I don't necessarily like there are, I think there are folks, and I think this is, these are the folks that Candela really serves who are like, I don't want to get lost in the weeds trying to figure out the solution. I don't necessarily need it to be completely spoon fed to me, but I, I want to follow the mystery, not so much as feel like I'm kind of putting it together like a puzzle, but like it's the fog is rolling back kind of scene by scene. I've also compared the mechanics because we talked a lot about railroading because a lot of our students are new players. And so they, um, there was a student who was like, well, you know, yeah, this, this one game has a lot more railroading, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, okay, so we're gonna have to pause. And how many people in this room know what railroading is? And a lot of people who are like, we don't know, Dr. Friedman, we don't know. And so I said, okay, we need to define. And uh, yeah, and so we explained railroading, this idea that uh, it's where choices are foreclosed. It's often used as a pejorative. And so I... Uh, when I talk about Candela, for example, don't talk about uh, it as a railroad because I do think that agency opens up in the final part um, as the kind of threat is revealed and the players are making choices, which is why I think uh, for those of you who are just joining us, I was talking with my students about uh, last week's Candela and how it starts at the end, at this moment of great player agency of an assignment before moving into the traditional or the, the planned phases of a typical Candela assignment. Um, I think of Candela structured um, as like the way that uh, a roller coaster is, which is it drags you up, don't get me wrong, it's pulling you along, and then it's going into the death drop, um, where it's Go, moving forward on the momentum. And we can almost think about that pulling action as kind of so, in some ways being kind of shifted by the bodies in the in the car, so to speak. I'm not sure that I love this metaphor, but it's one that I'm playing around with. Um, and yeah, there's uh, the, yeah, the, the, there's more to say about kind of carved uh, by Brindlewood uh, games like the in between and 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 that sort of thing, to to think about uh, kind of managing the me as a bad as a bad. I'm not his ideal player in when I do that action, uh, and I think that's something that we'll probably end up exploring um, as we move as we move forward. Uh, depending on, you know, again, so mu much of this class, for those of you who don't know, is uh, we are doing a kind of lore dump uh, uh, through the early part of the class. And increasingly across the 15 weeks, we open it up more and more. So we stop railroading and we start building to the open world where at the end students are creating projects that are theirs, uh, that they choose the format they choose one student said, Hey, Dr. Friedman, I think that my final project is going to be a painting. And I said, that's great. Uh, this is an English class. So um, for things that are non-textual or not, you know, kind of necessary, everyone's going to write a kind of artist statement, uh, kind of engaging with the kind of critical apparatus, uh, the, the games that inspired them or the thinking that we've encountered across the semester. Um, but that's where the, and some of them are going to design games. Some, many of them are teachers. They will design classes or um, kind of exercises for their future classes. Uh, but yeah, so this is, so we're moving in a similar kind of way from the railroad because the railroad is useful, right? The, the chain up the, uh, up the roller coaster is important because People, especially new guy, newbies, need a certain amount of support that they know that they're not wandering around in in the dark wood, um, unless what you're wanting to do is completely disorient people. And this is a previous conversation that students have had around Tim Hutchings' uh, journal games, uh, like Thousand Year Old Vampire, um, 
and be, which give you which give you a certain amount of guidance, but no kind of grand statement about what games are because we've previously looked at definitions for what a TTRPG are. Uh, and so that's been part of our kind of discourse is, oh, which games feel like they need to define themselves and which games don't, which are explaining what a role playing game is for people as if the players that are in front of them have never played a game before versus those like in Dream Askew, Dream Apart are articulating how this game is different from other games you might have come across, right? So belonging outside belonging games often make that move. Um, and then you get Yazebas, which is doing a little bit of both, which is kind of appealing to the folks who need to be reminded of childhood fantasy. Um, and I think that's everybody. I think that's both the a, a lot of the time uh, the TTRPG player as well as the total novice. Um, I think skeleton is, uh, is also useful. Um, it's interesting to think about it uh, in those ways um, because uh, skeleton kind of is a is a metaphor that kind of I find it is it, it assumes a wholeness that I'm not sure that always works for me but I think it's really I think it is a useful image um you know don't get me wrong uh, it's so interesting that I am here on YouTube <laughs> live uh in front of a half a dozen lovely humans thank you um and kind of uh talking about mechanics right after like a three hour hit piece landed on YouTube last week, using mechanics kind of as a, as a cudgel uh, to, to bash people they didn't agree with. Um, and one of the things that informed my pedagogy this week was very much kind of saying to my students, like, that's not what we're doing here. Just uh, this is a slight digression. Forgive me. This is, this is, this is office hours. This is what you get. Um, and so I said to my students, I, I didn't say anything specific, but I said the the important thing to remember is uh, many of these things are questions of taste uh, and preference and what kind of game you want to play at all, and also what kind of game you want to play right now, right? Brindlewood Bay came into my life in a time when I needed specifically what Brindlewood Bay could do. Um, and other games have come at the wrong time. I, I think Blaze in the Dark is super cool. It came into my life uh, in an embodied practice in a way that unfortunately fell apart. Like as many people will know, you know, uh, the, the biggest big bad evil guy of any tabletop game is scheduling for one thing. Uh, and it came into our lives when a lot of folks, including the person who wanted to run the game had little kids and that's really hard. Uh, so, you know, there's there's that element as well. We need different kinds of games at different parts of our lives. Um, we need them with different groups of people. There are games that I would love to play, uh, but the only scenarios in which I've been offered play are not ones where I necessarily feel excited or safe. Um, you know, uh, this is always why I'm always fascinated by, um, as someone who studies actual play and talks to a lot of people who are really hyped about the fact that I study actual play, um, will often kind of express desire to play with someone they've never met, but they know their play style from perform play and will say, oh, I really want to play with that person. I was like, and I'm always kind of like, I have not had that feeling. <laughs> uh, personally, I have not had that feeling. Uh, and maybe it's because I personally don't necessarily feel like I can hang or, uh, you know, in a kind of more performed style sort of way, or I'm not parasocial in some kind of way. I don't know. This is, this is a self-reflection thing that I'm really kind of working through as I write the book um, on actual, well, not the book on actual play, but a book on actual play in this sort of way. But yeah, Luke, as, as you note, right, like the theme of today and the thing that the students really picked up on immediately was the ways in which, um, you know, when we're talking about mechanics, we're talking about um, what characters can do, what players can do, uh, responsibilities of the facilitator, if there's a facilitator, um, within the scope of, you know, the reality that in some ways 
uh, those are often guidelines that can potentially end up broken uh, in some ways. But they are a sign of setting the initial kind of terms of engagement uh, that folks are kind of buying into uh, in a lot of in a lot of ways. And 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 uh, we're also talking, you know, and I gestured a little bit to this today. We'll probably go into it more, especially as we talk more and more about, um, you know, watching others play and they have their own play experiences in the coming weeks. Those of them who have not yet had them is the kind of different ways of treating, of thinking about one's characters in relationship to oneself as a player, right? There's the kind of actorly part of the spectrum or habitus or way of, of, of relating um, where you are doing a kind of embodied uh, experience. There's the more authorial way where you're kind of, you know, it's your blorbo and you can smash it if you want to. And a player can move between those poles and other ways of relating, right? That's why I really love that we're taking a break to do the quiet year and dialect, which have very different kinds of relationships built into the mechanics uh, for the player to relate to what's being told, right? Uh, the quiet year doesn't have characters, uh, not even emergent characters like they experienced in For the Queen. Instead, they, you are the community. And sometimes you might speak for one member of the community, but most of the time you're speaking for the whole and you're explicitly being encouraged to add in complications. Um, dialect, you do have a, a particular character and you do have kind of moments of dialogue, but still you're actively creating an apocalypse, right? You're creating a scenario in which this, this isolated dialect is going to die uh, and you have to figure out how to do that. Uh, so it's, I'm glad that as after we've had this kind of conversation, I'm throwing them into these places where they can't stick with the kind of players play characters in role playing games always. Um, it was not entirely my intention. Real talk, the structure of this class has been really shaped in a lot of ways, especially in these first weeks, by the fact that I needed to make sure that there was room for our guests. Uh, so Dragon Con just happened in Atlanta, and that's why Josh was here last Thursday. Uh, Ned is available uh, and here uh, on th next uh, this Thursday. Um, Gabe will be coming. Gabe Hicks will be here in the middle of October, and Taylor Moore is coming home to Alabama for Thanksgiving, and so he's extending his stay to 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 hang out with my students on the last week of class, which is, I think, going to be actually really useful because if there's ever a kind of big ideas guy to have my students bring their A game to, I think it's Taylor Moore. Uh, but what that has meant is the rhythm from the previous iterations of this class where we might be doing a lot more reading uh, in these early weeks. We are in week four at the moment. Uh, it was kind of jostled by the fact that we had these kind of AMA kind of days where there's not so much assigned reading in preparation for uh, our class visits. Uh, so it's been really interesting to see how the class transforms depending on what we're playing. And this adoption of a TTRPG is a total new kind of innovation um, for the class this time, uh, for, uh, in 2021, uh, the class was very much games as storytelling and tabletop was right in the beating heart of it. But we also did some, uh, kind of looking at twine games at interactive fiction, as well as games like Disco Elysium. And we focused in on much more on actual play and its affordances and the way that it's structured for the honors research seminar I ran last fall. And so now this is kind of the third iteration of thinking about what does it mean to teach tabletop games now uh, in all their complexity and all their richness. Where does D&D &D fit into all of this? Where do any of the big guys fit into all of this, given that the scholarship 
is overwhelmingly assuming that you know at le at bare minimum a D20 system. And so far, we've managed to get away with not really talking much about D and D, but that's going to change on Thursday uh, by necessity of talking about uh, D what D and D and Wizards of the Coast and E one uh, have cooked up for their new channel. And I'm really pleased with this class so far. I mean, so the other thing that's happening this week and because, and we're kind of doing a kind of whole look at the week because, because there's a visitor on Thursday, I won't be doing office hour until next Tuesday. But on uh, the other thing that I'm doing right now is looking through the student contracts. So this is a, a class where the students decide what kind of labor they want to agree to do for the class. And we negotiate this week and I sign off on it. And so far, everybody it has very clearly kind of articulated uh, what their goals are. And then the rubber will meet the road at about week seven or eight where we see, okay, so how much have you actually gotten done? How are you going to make sure that you get to where you want to be by the end of the semester? Um, for those who are new, uh, I am a professor at a tenured professor at a what's called a research one state university here in Alabama. And uh, for uh, a variety of reasons. Um, this is my only class this semester, uh, and I have 13 students. So this is a very high touch class in terms of uh, coaching in these kinds of ways. Uh, and in fact, this YouTube channel uh, very much started because uh, we were coming back from remote uh, teaching. We had barely gotten a vaccine at that point. And I didn't want students to come sick to a class that's an active learning class that doesn't have lectures. So I did these recaps as a kind of me talking to the camera for 20 minutes and then futzing around endlessly with adding stuff uh, in post and then finding out my students didn't really need them but my colleagues who are teachers and other curious folks uh, were the ones who were really consuming it. So this is the new experiment of office hour of kind of answering questions and curiosities. And for every person who said that they really wanted to be in my class, this is kind of an opportunity to at least get a little bit of a taste of what it's like uh, for this particular class. Um, uh, so yeah, Th yeah. Thanks, Esther. Uh, I'm so excited that you're gonna like be our uh, kind of a, vir a, a virtual presence with us. Um, and I, of course, am not inventing anything when it comes to to labor based assessment. Uh, and this is a kind of something that many of us are refining. I learn. I've learned a lot from. Um, from Jesse Stommel, uh, Jessifer on most socials, who has literally written one of the books on ungrading, um, which is basically the kind of umbrella term for a lot of these practices that are trying to get students to move away from the idea that the professor is this arbitrary kind of you know, authority handing out grades that may or may not seem fair or reasonable or connected to reality. Uh, and there's different kinds of strategies for how to do that work. I've been really inspired by my colleagues, Kate Osmond at Cal Poly Pomona and, um, and Ryan Cordell, who was formerly at Northeastern and is now at Oh God, UIUC, I think. I sorry if in the unlikely event that Ryan ever sees this and I fucked it up, I'm sorry. Uh, but so they've done a lot of work with building out kind of schema for allowing students to feel like they have ownership of the choices that they're making. Like not everyone's gonna get an A. But basically, I've tried to calculate what are the kinds of tasks, and there are course workload estimators, Rice University does one, um, Wake Forest does another one, where you can literally put in, like, I want students to read this many things of this many pages and read in this kind of way, like, are they skimming it? Are they doing a deep dive? Uh, I want them to watch this amount of content. Uh, I want them to do a task that takes four hours. Um, 
you know, and is that a fair amount considering what my university expects students to do outside of class? Uh, and I can take that to students and say, yeah, this is the deal. And so if students exceed that uh, or meet that kind of outside of class expectation in terms of labor, uh, it's very likely that their contract will and uh, will reflect that they got an A, uh, for example. Uh, at mid-semester, what's been really interesting about this class is we sit, I sit down with every student and we go over the contract and we say, okay, so what have you gotten done? And what's the plan to get you to the end of the semester? And I have some students say, hey, Dr. Friedman, I, I thought I was contracting for an A, but my priorities are shifted or my spoons are depleted or whatever. And we figure out, you know, are you good with a B? Um, you know, and many times that actually does happen. Uh, does Now, I will say, this is not a one size fits all. It works in this class because this is a, a small class that is built on trust and radical transparency. And not even I can do that in every class all the time. The other class that I teach is 100 plus students with four GTAs. Rat, what what that labor looks like is very different, um, but that's a probably a different office hour uh, unless people have questions about how large literature classes work. Um, teaching to transgress is basically, I mean, I would not, it is a touchstone for me. Uh, and I would not say I am a good example of, of, of what Hooks is imagining uh, and, and embodying uh, by any stretch of the imagination. But when I think about what I want a classroom to be, uh, it's, I come back to Hooks. Uh, you know, she, Hooks is the well that many of us come back to, to kind of remind ourselves. And I'll be honest, this is a really difficult time to be a teacher at any level. Uh, if you do not, if you are watching this and you do not know the state of public higher education in the United States and quite frankly in the UK, uh, we're in big trouble, guys. Um, you know, uh, th the fact that I'm doing these office hours is uh, a testimony to my trust in the security of my job. Uh, not that I do anything particularly weird or wacky, but you know, I've had friends who've lost jobs over social media, um, benign posts. Um, you know, I, my friends at West Virginia University are, are really struggling and please support their, their struggle to, you know, not have their, their university dismantled, um, because of, you know, financial malfeasance on the part of, uh, their their superiors. Uh, it's it's a it's a rough world, and um, you know I was hired in a time when uh, I applied to thirty jobs, and most of them didn't hire anyone. And when I say thirty, I mean I applied to anything I could remotely be considered to be like qualified in, which was way more jobs than actually I sh I probably was qualified for in terms of my specialty. Uh, and now my my junior colleagues who are now on the market will call themselves lucky if there's one job in our field um, for the dozens or hundreds of people who are seeking labor, who are seeking work. Um, this, you know, I have to, one of the things I have to constantly remind my students when they praise me is I, I'm lucky to be able to do this class in the way that I do because I'm not teaching four classes. I'm not teaching hundreds of students every semester. I'm able to be creative in these kinds of ways. And uh, that's incredibly important. And I wish all of my colleagues had not only the intellectual freedom that was protected, but also the the kind of intellectual time uh and to 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 innovate and i will say like my colleagues who are lecturers which is our kind of teaching track faculty and the graduate students i have the privilege of working alongside as teachers are indeed brilliant creative um and really just astonishing educators 
but they have so much less time and thus so much less energy in order to do the work that they so brilliantly do. Um, and so uh, this has been your office hours kind of reminder that, um, you know, classes like mine, if you think there should be more classes like mine uh, kind of in the world, please support, you know, the de-adjunctification of higher education that um you know, in the same way, and my class is literally in the shadow um, and solidarity of the SAG and WGA strike, uh, and our struggles are very much the same. Um, many people think that Hollywood all, all looks like the most successful celebrities, and a lot of people think that higher education looks not even just like me, but like the most successful academics uh, who are able to kind of hop between jobs or are highly visible. Um, the invisible uh, folks, both of entertainment and of higher ed, are the people who don't have time to be highly visible in this kind of way uh, because they're too busy doing their jobs for not enough pay and not enough security and you know, maybe or maybe not healthcare and all these sorts of things. Uh, so uh, this is why I do what I do. This is why I study, quite honestly, tabletop and actual play is because I see the struggles of my field mirrored in the struggles of these fields and preserving this art and thinking very seriously and taking seriously this art is an opportunity that I could not let pass by in an important moment of its kind of flowering and um, actively watching so much being forgotten. And I cannot believe that one in two weeks, we're going to have big bad con. I cannot believe that there are no more seats uh, for the panel that John Boltana and I are doing. Um, but I've already started working on my prepared comments. John and I are keeping it to a half hour total for both of our opening remarks so that we can have a big conversation in the room. Uh, and that's real hard when you're trying to kind of say, this is all the stuff that people are doing in T TRPG and actual play research. Please support us. Uh, and there's more people who would like to come and be in this conversation. Please and thank you. Uh, and, and, but one of the things that I'm trying to, I'm trying to figure out if it's a kill your darling situation or whether it's the, the whole point of why I'm saying anything, which is, uh, that I am a scholar of the 18th century novel, which looks different in the 20th century because of what's called the great forgetting that was enacted upon it in the late 18th and early 19th century by, by male critics, um, and uh, it has been the work of my lifetime and uh, and beyond that by scholars, by generations of scholars to do the recovery work, to recover the progressive novels, the experimental novels, and overwhelmingly the, the novels written by women uh, and indeed uh, potentially uh, people of color in, in some cases, uh, the stories are fuzzy, documentation is hard, uh, but uh, that's all recovery work we've had to do because there was one idea about what the novel was supposed to be um, that was imposed upon it decades into its making, and that ripple effect meant that everything else was considered illegitimate and not worthy of study by the time the novel is finally were considered worthy of study in the early 20th century, and thus we bear the scars of our own cultural narrowness. And now I'm trying to figure out how do we avoid the great forgetting uh, of TTRPGs and of actual play um, or the narrowing of the definition uh, so that we forget a lot of uh, what was there. And I watch that forgetting happening all the time. Thus, endeth the lecture. Um, thank you all so much for spending some time in this office hour with me. I will be back on uh, next Tuesday. Uh, and luckily for you, uh, I will be 
uh, able to keep to a Tuesday, Thursday office hour schedule. Uh, so if Tuesdays don't work for you, Thursdays will be around uh, for the next couple of weeks. I can't promise what Big Bad Con is going to do to this schedule. Uh, we're we're going to find out. Uh, we may catch us poolside or the technology may just blow up in all of our faces. Who can say? Uh, but as always, it is a privilege to be uh, viewed by each and every one of you and for your thoughts and reflections, which have been captured for those who are uh, not with us synchronously. I have realized to my uh, delight and terror that uh, we are also addressing an asynchronous audience. So if you are coming after the fact, thank you so much. F please feel free to throw questions or curiosities in the comments, and I will make sure that I include answers to them in the next Office Hour video. Uh, until then, thank you so much, and I will see you very soon. Thank you.